Good evening. I just want you to know I love Uganda. I do. Um, you might not know this, but, uh, but I, I graduated from college and God had put on my heart to do ministry. And out of all of the places in the world where I could go, God sent me to Uganda first. So 30, 34 years ago, uh, I got on a plane and came here to Uganda. And now I've been back about, you know, 10 times. And I love seeing what God is doing in this incredible country. You guys are so richly blessed. A little, uh, a little funny story, you know, we graduated from college. We didn't have any money. We had just started a ministry. Nobody even knew that we existed. We had a handful of friends that gave us a few dollars, just enough money to buy a plane ticket from the United States and fly over to Nairobi. And then we got on a bus from Nairobi across the border and came to Kampala. And we, we had just a few dollars left over uh, to buy some food. We were going to be here for six weeks. And we spent six weeks here in Uganda. And we didn't have enough money to go to restaurants. We didn't have enough. We just had enough money to buy some rice, to buy some potatoes. And that's what we had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We had rice and potatoes for breakfast, rice and potatoes for lunch, and rice and potatoes for, for dinner. And after being here for six weeks, my friend who was traveling with me, he looked at me and he said, Rob, I'm going to send a letter to your parents with a note that says for $10 a month you could feed this poor starving child. <laughs> anyway, I, I love what God's doing here in Uganda. We love being here. And I'm very, very excited uh, to be a part of this gathering, this gathering of leaders business leaders, educational leaders, uh, perhaps medical leaders, uh, political leaders, uh, leaders that want to transform uh, this community with the glory and the message of God's grace and God's love. And, uh, and, and I feel like God has given me assignment. I'm, I'm really looking forward to preaching at all of the services this coming weekend. But the reason why I came here this time is for this meeting, for this gathering of, of believers. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. Uh, I, I want you to know that when God wants to get something done, he has to raise up people to partner with him. If there's going to be hospitals that are going to be built, they don't just appear down from heaven on earth. He has to inspire people to build hospitals. He's got to inspire and and challenge people to build schools. He's got to give insight and dreams to people to build businesses. If God wants to transform the political arena of any community, of any nation, any city, he's got to raise up his sons and daughters and give them a dream and partner with them to get it done. God doesn't drop businesses from heaven. He doesn't drop schools from heaven. He doesn't drop churches from heaven. He inspires his sons and daughters and partners with them to make a difference in the world. I'm reminded of the story of a pastor who, uh, who um, for retirement, was working on an old cottage. And uh, it was outside of the, of the city. And, and uh, on his day off, he would go out to this cottage and he would work on it. And one day he would just paint a wall. Another day he might, you know, fix the fence. Another day he would replace the windows in the cottage. And, and over many, many years of working on this cottage, it had been transformed from this dilapidated old shack to a beautiful place where he would retire with his wife in a few years to come. One day he was sitting on the porch of this beautiful cottage when one of the members of the congregation walked by and saw the pastor sitting there at this beautiful cottage and this congregational member said to the pastor, wow, the Lord has blessed you with a wonderful place. And the pastor kind of smiled and, and shouted back to the congregational member and said, 
Well, you should have seen it when he had it all to himself. The truth is, is anything's going to get done, it's going to happen with God partnering with each and every one of us. I was, uh, I was asked to kind of speak around a topic about dealing with giants. That's the theme, right, of our gathering, dealing with, with giants. Uh, just, just as a, as a um, for my own benefit, uh, how many of you are imperfect? Let me, let me, let me just see your hands. You, you don't have it all together. Uh, let me ask it another way. How many of you are totally perfect and you never make mistakes? Is there anybody... Okay, I, I'm, I'm in good company, all right? Um, because, you know, I can get pretty messed up. Even though I'm a pastor and I've been a pastor for many years, I, I can actually, you know, surprise myself with some of the things that I end up doing. Like not too long ago, I was asked to speak at a church in Florida. I live in Texas. And, uh, and they wanted me to, t to talk on the subject of love. Uh, they had heard me doing a seminar on love and how to love, and they were really excited about that message. And they said, would you come and preach that message at our church? And so because it was in Florida and it was over the spring break uh, vacation time in my own town, I decided to go to this church and bring my whole family with me. And so I got on a plane in Austin and flew to Dallas. And there wasn't a whole lot of time between the time that my plane landed and the next plane would take off to Florida, but the kids were hungry and they wanted something to eat. And so we, we, we got in line at a Taco Bell in, in the airport and we were, you know, slowly making our way to the front of the line. Well, when I got to the front of the line, a big guy, I mean, he was like big, he was a giant of a man, just cut right in front of me. Now, I'm going to, to travel to this church to speak on love, but love was not what I was feeling in that moment when he cut in front of me. In fact, I started feeling things on the inside that I haven't felt since high school. <laughs> and I looked up at that guy, and he was a giant, man. He was a giant. And I, and I looked at him, and I could tell that my family... And some of the people that were behind me in line were expecting me to man up and do something about this guy cutting in front of me. So I looked up at him, and he was a big man. And I said, are you going to cut? And he looked down at me, and he said, yep. <laughs> well, now what am I going to do? So we started having an argument. And it was going downhill pretty fast. We were referencing each other's mothers. I mean, it was really... It was really going downhill. And then when just about, I don't know, I was getting so emotional, my son's standing right behind me. Now, keep in mind, I'm a pastor going to preach on love. My son standing behind me whispers in my ear, and he says, Dad, we can take him right now, right here. I share that story, and I was able to dial down the emotions in that moment. I share that story that there's not something entirely wrong with you getting stirred up by the giants that are in our lives. There's not something entirely wrong with you getting emotional about things in your community, things in your sphere of influence, things in your business, things in your nation that need to change. And they might look to you to be like a giant. But I'm here to tell you that God wants to bring down those giants in your life, in your business, in your community, in leadership. God wants to bring those giants down. Now, the... Uh, the theme that we're gonna that we're gonna deal with for the next couple of days, and I and I just want you to know uh, that I've got a, a a series of lessons that I'm going to present to you in three parts. So tonight, tomorrow night, and Saturday morning, the parts that I have to play in this particular conference, um, and we're going to be talking about leadership secrets from the greatest lion. Uh, the greatest giant slayer of them all. We're going to be talking about learning some leadership secrets.
from the greatest giant slayer of all. Now to set this up, we want to talk a little bit about, uh, about giants, okay? And, uh, and, and Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14 kind of describe an experience that I think is common to every single one of us. The children of Israel are at the edge of the promised land. Keep in mind that God worked some absolutely incredible miracles to get them there. The ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the provision of manna from heaven, water from a rock, you know, birds that would just fly overhead and fall down and die and they would eat. I mean, God worked miracles to get them to the promised land. They're at the edge of that promised land and God tells Moses to send out some spies into the land. And uh, 12 spies go into the, the land representing the 12 tribes of, of Israel and, and 10 of them come back with a negative report. 10 of them come back with a bad testimony. And, and I want to read their description uh, found in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 32 and 33. Listen to what these 10 spies, now two of them came back with a positive report, but I, I want to focus for a moment on the report of the 10 negative spies. Listen to what they said. The land we explored, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, by the way. It's everything that God promised that it would be. But the land we explored devours those that are living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. The giants of Anak were there. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. We were grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we became in their sight. And I just want you to understand something that's true universally, whether you live here or anywhere else in the world, your spirit will always speak louder than your words. What's on the inside will often determine how other people perceive you. They looked at those giants, and in comparison to those giants, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And guess what? The giants saw them the same way. We have got to change what's going on on the inside of us. And we need to see ourselves as we really are in order to slay the giants in our own lives, and in our community, and in our nation. And, uh, and I want to talk about that transformation process. I want you to, I want you to understand that, that we're going to talk about some leadership secrets that will do that inner transformation on the inside of you so that you would have the power to see the world differently. Are you with me? Now, now you might... Uh, you might understand that the, the, the giant slayer that we're going to talk about uh, for the next couple of days is none other than David. And I want to read a passage of scripture to you as we kind of kick it off here. Uh, we all face giants, uh, but we're going to learn here tonight and tomorrow how to defeat the giants in our lives. And I want to read this passage of scripture from 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 15 through 17. David is tired, and, and he has an experience that when I read it, literally, I couldn't get this out of my heart. I couldn't get this particular experience out of my mind. It, it just, for weeks and weeks and weeks, I was just thinking about what this verse communicates. It says that David longed for water. And he said, oh, that someone would get me a drink, a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. Then three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord and he said, far be it from me 
Lord, to do this? Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives and David wouldn't drink it? David wouldn't drink it. Here is David. He's sitting on a rock, perhaps, surrounded by his mighty men. And all he does is just sigh. He said, oh, man, I would love a drink of water from the wells at Bethlehem. He wasn't asking anybody to go. He was just kind of like sighing. He was just, oh, man, wouldn't it be great? just to get a glass of water from my favorite well. He never said it because he wanted people to risk their lives to get it. But all on their own, three mighty men that followed David on their own initiative, at the risk of their own lives, broke through the enemy lines just to get David a glass of water. And what I couldn't get out of my mind and I couldn't get out of my heart is what kind of leader must David have been to inspire that kind of loyalty? Because I'm thinking to myself when I'm reading this story is I can't even get my kids to do their homework. (laughs) I have trouble getting ushers to greet at the door of our church. And here is David, all he does is sigh, I'd like a glass of water, and it inspires these guys at the risk of their lives to go get what was just a desire for him. And I'm thinking to myself, what kind of leader must David have been? And Lord, could you make me that kind of leader? Can I be that kind of leader? Because that's the kind of leadership we need if we're going to build great businesses. That's the kind of leadership we need if we're going to build a great country, if we're going to build a great education, if we're going to build great hospitals, if we're going to build great churches. We need that kind of leadership. So, so, so what did David have that produced that kind of loyalty? In Psalm 78 and verse 72, we get a little bit of an insight. It says that David shepherded them with integrity of heart, and with skillful hands, he led them. The, uh, the topic that I want to address tonight is David inspired that kind of loyalty because he lived from the heart. He lived from the heart. He led from the heart. I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts that I want you to write down uh, because I'm going to give you five things uh, that you're going to need to kind of incorporate into your leadership skill set, if you will, if you're going to inspire that kind of loyalty in the people you're hoping to lead. The first is you must learn to live from the inside. You got to learn to live from your heart instead of your head. The foundation of effective organizations and businesses and any endeavor you put your hand to do always comes down to the conviction of your heart. Conviction of your heart trumps mental strategy and ideas. Now, of course, strategy and thinking things through and having a good, sharp mind is important, but it's not more important than the heart. Let me me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The, The head tends to be a little bit more shallow, but the heart kind of boils things down to its most noble ambition. In the context of what I do as a pastor of a church, I've discovered that if I want to lead a big church, that's leading from the head. But if I want to see as many lives changed as I possibly can for the glory of God, that's leading from the heart. You see the difference? 
if I want the finest music that you could ever experience, that's leading from the head. But if I want authentic worship, that's leading from the heart. If I want small groups in our church because I want to close the back door and retain as many people as I can, that's leading from the head. But if I want authentic community and camaraderie where people genuinely care for each other, that's leading from the heart. And I just want to encourage you that you will never inspire the mighty men that you surround yourself with, the mighty women you surround yourself with. You'll never inspire them to great acts of daring and, and, and courage and sacrifice by leading from the head. It only comes when you lead from the heart. People are not inspired in the head. They are inspired in the heart. I, um, I was uh, um, receiving a text yesterday from a young couple in our church that are now going to be featured on three broadcasts of a national television program. Let me, let me tell you how it started. This young couple in our church, very, very much like any other young couple in our church, and I would dare say just like any person that's even here tonight, just a, a genuine God follower, a sincere worshiper. This couple genuinely, you know, wanted to live their lives, you know, for the glory of God and wanted to use their gifts and talents to make a difference. And they started a little company. But let me tell you something about why this company was started. They, they started this company because they wanted to glorify God in the marketplace. That, that's what they really felt was their calling. And, uh, and, and so I kind of watched this thing unfold. I, I don't know if you're uh, aware of any, you know, television programs that are in the United States of America. But this small little company started as an internet company uh, called Grace and Lace. And they made specialty socks, uh, you know, kind of like high fashion socks that were popular in our country. And, 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 and women, you know, started to buy these, these socks and, and, uh, and, and they would just go online and and, uh, and, and, and this company started to take off. And then it was soon it was making like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then, uh, you know, not too long, it started making millions of dollars. And, and then they, um, uh, they were contacted by a television show in the United States. It's called Shark Tank. Has anybody ever heard of that show? It's a, it's a show where, um, you know, very prominent, super wealthy business people sit on a panel and they interview up and coming companies and they actually make an offer on television to buy into these companies to, to expand them and grow them so that they could even be larger. Well, it's a huge, huge privilege to be invited to actually be on a television show like that. And, uh, and, and so uh, they, they, they went there and I still remember them texting me saying, Pastor, we got invited to be on Shark Tank. And, uh, and, and I knew that it was a big deal, so I'm praying, my wife's praying, our leadership team is praying. They get on this show, and they just radiate excellence and compassion and, and clarity and conviction and heart. And, and they didn't have the opportunity. They, they actually did, in the taping of the show, talk about Jesus. But that never quite made it into the national broadcast, right? But still, it was in the core of who they were. All three of the judges, which is really rare, wanted to buy into the company. And they turned down two of them because they knew that the values that they lived their lives by would not be consistent with their company. They had from the beginning only one person on that panel that they wanted to do business with. And they made a deal with her. And together they have now blossomed this company into a multi, multi-million dollar enterprise. And they're using their resources to make a huge contribution all around the world. I'm just telling you that heart matters. So don't lead from the head. You got to lead from the heart. Are you with me? So I'm looking at that clock and 
it says I have 15 minutes. Is that right? So it's counting down, right? And I've got five things that I want to share with you. I gave you one. So I'm going to kind of step it up, all right? My introduction went a little bit longer than I anticipated. But I'm going to give it to you, okay? So number two, if number one, you have to lead from the heart, you got to live from the heart. Number two, you must have a heart after God. Out of all of the adventures and exploits that David experienced, you know what got God's attention? It wasn't that he was a faithful shepherd. It wasn't that he was a mighty warrior. And it wasn't that he was a brilliant king. Even though all of those things were true, what got God's attention was that David was a man after God's own heart. That's what we remember. That's what the Bible records about David. And he had his flaws and he had his challenges. Don't get me wrong. But somewhere he lived with this authentic devotion to God. And maybe one of the best examples of it. When David first became king, the very first thing he did was he brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. Saul, the previous king, you know what? He didn't care. He just didn't care. But David cared about the things that God cared about. And you just can't remove that from the equation. If you want to be the leader that inspires people to, to do what these mighty men did on behalf of David, you're going to have to learn to have a heart after God. You can't compromise there and win in any significant way. The ark was everything. It represented the presence of God, blood sacrifices for reconciliation. It was where the holy of holies and, 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 and all that, that that represented was made manifest. Saul didn't care. David did. And not only did he bring the ark of the covenant into Jerusalem, the Bible says he danced before the ark with all of his might. And he was like making a fool of himself. But you know what? He didn't care. He didn't care what anybody else thought. He didn't care what anybody else did. He cared about, about God. Third thought. Now, now that clock is going up. It was 15 minutes and now it's 16 minutes. And I just preached for five minutes. It's a miracle. <laughs> Number three, you got to have a heart of care and service. You got to really care about the people that you're working with and who are working for you. David poured out the water. Why? Because he never wanted to empower that kind of foolishness again in the future. Here were these guys, they risked their lives, broke through enemy lines, got the water, came all the way back and gave it to David. And even though he wanted a drink from the well of Bethlehem, he didn't drink it. Why? Because he knew if he did that he might empower some of that foolish behavior in someone else and he cared too much about the people he was leading. In fact, he cared more about them than he did his own well-being. Think about that for a moment. There are many benefits and many blessings that come with leadership, but they only come when you recognize your heart and your care for the people you're leading, that you love them and care for them and have their best interest in mind. You know what the problem is in a lot of nations and a lot of places is that people who get into power just gravitate all of the blessings they can their way and they don't care who gets stepped on, who gets abused, who gets marginalized, who gets disenfranchised. They don't care. That kind of leadership will never inspire loyalty. But there is a leadership that does. You know, you hear stories, at least I did in our country, 
about generals who led their armies into battle during World War II. And the generals that were held with the deepest regard, the deepest respect, the deepest love, the, the kind of generals that inspired the utmost in loyalty were the generals who cared about their troops. And they would say about some generals, you know what, they wouldn't eat until the troops ate. And if there was a long march, guess what? They were out front leading the way. There's something about that kind of leadership that people are longing to follow. So have a heart of care and service. What am I at, number four? A heart of humility. Can I tell you something? In God's kingdom, that doesn't happen everywhere, but in God's kingdom, you don't ascend to greatness, you descend to greatness in God's kingdom. If you look at the life of David, it's a fascinating story. A shepherd boy who loves to sing writes a psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He sings songs on the backside of a mountain, worshiping his God. One day, a lion comes to steal from the sheep. He kills the lion. Another day, a bear comes. He kills the bear. And then one day, completely out of the blue, he's anointed the next king. Things start to move fast in David's life. He kills Goliath. He's invited to the king's table. He's made a general. He's married to the king's daughter. And I can think David, you know, sitting at the king's table, his reputation expanding, people saying of David that he kills his tens of thousands and Saul only his thousands. I, I can see David thinking at that moment, man, I was anointed to be king and, 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 and I'm on track, man. Things are happening. I was on the backside of a, of a mountain. Nobody even knew my name. Now I'm sitting at the king's table. I can see I'm like one step away from this whole thing coming to pass. He was ascending into greatness. But David's about to learn that you don't ascend into greatness. You descend into greatness. Pastor Gary just already talked about it, Jesus descended into greatness. He left heaven for earth. He left the unlimited for the limited. He left glory and went to the cross. And the biggest journey of all, he left his perfect holiness and took on sin, the sin of the entire human race. And then the Bible says God exalted him above every name. If you look at the life of Joseph, it's another example of descending into greatness. Joseph had a dream that he would be a ruler, that God would use him in powerful ways, in, in, in politics and in leadership. He had a dream like maybe some of you have even here tonight. But Joseph, the favorite son of his father, went from son to a pit, and then from a pit to slavery, and then from slavery to a prison. And I mention that only because I, will, I don't want you to be discouraged if, if you're here tonight and you've got a big dream on the inside of you, but it seems like you're headed in the wrong direction. It seems like, you know, the dream is getting further and further away. That's the case here for Joseph. He had a dream that God would use him to, to deliver people and to rescue people and to, and to be a great political leader. But man, he goes from son to the pit, from pit to slavery, from slavery to a prison cell. Let me tell you something. In one day, he went from prison to the palace. In one day. So if you're on the journey and it looks like you're heading in the wrong direction, don't give up. David is sitting around the king's table, right? Everything's going his way. I mean, everything's good. He's a great warrior. He's married to the king's daughter. He's, he's singing worship songs that everybody loves. Life is good. 
And then out of almost nowhere, a spear comes. And he's got a duck. And the first thing that David loses is his job. And then he goes home to his wife. The second thing he loses is his relationship with his wife. The third thing he loses is this really incredible relationship he had with his mentor. And then the fourth thing he loses is his best friend, Jonathan. You understand what I'm talking about? He's at the king's table. He loses his job. He loses his family. He loses his leader, his mentor, and he loses his best friend. And then there's one thing more he loses, and it's really almost too, too difficult to even bear. He loses his dignity. Because the Bible says that he's, he's such a threat to Israel that nobody wants him in Israel. And he's such a threat to other nations that nobody wants him there either. And he finds himself in a foreign place with a king who has to decide whether or not to kill him. And you know what David has to do? He has to fake like he is gone completely mad. And he's foaming at the mouth and he's rolling around on the floor in front of the king. Can you imagine how far he must have felt like he had fallen. But here's something that I want you to recognize. The Bible actually says that David wrote one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 34. It says that he wrote this Psalm after that episode of losing his dignity in front of that foreign king. And here's the Psalm that I want you to hear that he wrote after he lost everything. He says, I will exalt the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know why David could write a psalm like that? It's because he knew that in God's kingdom you descend into greatness. It's important that we descend into greatness for two critical reasons. One is that God wants to make sure that he's first place in your life. And number two, he wants to mold you into a vessel that he can use truly for his glory. John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He must increase. The truth is that this dying world that we're surrounded with, they really don't need to see us. They need to see Jesus in us. That's the only thing that's gonna transform our world. And then let me close with this final thought, a heart of passion. It seems like there are two groups of people in the world. Those who just get by and those who do whatever it takes. You know what I love about the story of David is that when he, when he got to the battle line and there was that giant out there in the, in the valley shouting his blasphemies, boastful and arrogant. The Bible says that David ran to meet that giant. He didn't walk. He didn't, you know, try to gather a whole bunch of other, he ran to meet that giant. In the heart of David, there was passion. And I just want to encourage you, nothing ever great happens without passion. You'll never do anything significant unless your heart 
is moved with passion. There's a story in the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 1. Just in case you're wondering whether or not God cares about whether you give your best or not. The prophet Malachi is looking at the children of Israel and he's pretty upset because the children of Israel are not giving to God their very best. In fact, they're giving leftovers. You know, the, the sacrifices that the children of Israel were to give to the, to the Lord were unblemished lambs, the ones that were really valuable, the ones that were the best. But the children of Israel kind of you know, did this little mental walk in their thinking um, and, and came to the conclusion that, hey, let's not give to, to God the unblemished lands because, man, we can get a lot of money for them. Let's give to God these blemished lambs, these lambs that have no market value. We'll give that to God so we can keep the other ones for ourselves. And the prophet looks at what the children of Israel are doing, and this is what he says. He says, how dare you give to God that which you wouldn't even give to your governor? How dare you give to God what you wouldn't give to your governor? I've shared that story with our staff. I told them. Listen, no unblemished lambs. Man, we want to give to God our very best. And I, and I posed it this way. I said, would we do anything different this Sunday if we knew that the governor of Texas was coming to church? Would we do anything different? Would, would, would we get like nice looking people to greet at the front door? Would we practice extra hard with the worship team to make sure the songs were really, really good? Would I work a little bit harder on my message because the governor was gonna be there? If the answer to that question is yes, then there's something wrong with our hearts because there's someone far greater than the governor that comes to church every single week, and that's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And let me tell you else who's greater than the governor Every lost and hurting person that doesn't know about the amazing love and grace of our God is more important than any government official. We ought to give our very best because that's what God requires. <laughs> leadership is critical. They say that everything rises and falls on leadership. If we're gonna build great businesses, build great hospitals, build great schools and build great churches. We need awesome leaders. Be the kind of leader that inspires what David inspired in the men who followed him. And to do that, you're gonna have to do a heart check. You're gonna have to live from the heart. You're gonna have to have a heart after God. You're gonna have to serve from the heart. You're gonna to have to have a heart of humility and you're gonna to have to have a heart of passion. God bless you, thank you.